right, so this talks about MyTardis, the data management software um, many of you will have seen before. So I'm going to focus on, on new things and, and a summary of the problem and, and stuff we've been doing in the last year. Uh, and it's become recently dear to my heart, um, uh, the kind of genomic space. So I'm going to outline the kinds of problems that TARDIS uh, are looking at and the problems we, we see over and over again uh, no matter what kind of scientific facility or scientific data or discipline that we're dealing with. These problems uh, occur over and over again and they're only going to get worse. Um, what I refer to um, primarily is, is this graph right here, um, which shows uh, the cost of um, essentially genome sequencing. Uh, originally with the Human uh, Genome Project, it was billions of dollars and uh, it's actually gone down. Uh, it's um, far outstripping even Moore's law uh, in, in cheapness and power. So the ideal of a thousand dollar personal genome uh, is, is a reality now really. You can go and get your, your genome uh, yourself sequenced and, and people can find out all kinds of things about you and this has profound implications uh, clinically you know for, for cancers and all kinds of things uh, the, these um, sequencing machines the next gen sequences are going to become uh, as ubiquitous as MRI machines uh, or CT scanners in the future and and uh, for better or worse they produce gigabytes of data already you know per 10 minutes and this is uh, creates new problems that people don't usually see with things like MRIs and now the computer's sleeping. Um, so, I think it's locked. No, no, it's not locked. Keep clicking. Okay. Okay, so it's getting cheaper. And the problem is not actually the, the volume of data coming out is not the problem. The, uh, the real problem here is, is that the instruments are actually getting more numerous and distributed. Uh, distributed. And so, if that's a snapshot of March this year, they're all the sequencing centers in the world. And uh, so there's obviously a concentration in North America in, in certain parts of Western Europe. Uh, Australia's playing a little bit in the space. Uh, but they're producing 15 petabytes a year uh, as of January uh, 25. So you can kind of see that growth level. But what we're really talking about here is because this stuff's getting cheaper and cheaper, it's going to look like that. Um, the sequences are going to get so common and, and instruments like this are getting so much cheaper and so much more common that the e-research problem doesn't become these massive facilities producing terabytes and petabytes and exabytes of data. It becomes, well, every hospital's now, you know, going to have five sequences and, and how do you manage that uh, across different identity domains? How do you manage the different in the instruments, the fact that there are so many of them and, and they vary so much. Um, what do you do about that? The problem is not the, the sheer volume, it's actually the variance. And so the problem we keep seeing over and over again in TARDIS land is, is, is actually kind of unlike the problem uh, Tom was talking about in his keynote about the synchrotron. The synchrotron, one large facility, uh, a few beam lines, a handful of beam lines, lots of data. But the problems we want to see are kind of more dumb than that, or that we see all the time are, are more dumb than that. And they're summed up in these four points that I have, and then I'll pass it on to, to James and Grisha of how they, they're kind of looking at solving this stuff. I want my data to organize, describe, and archive itself. Um, that's, that's a really big one. Obviously, our game is connecting to instruments, but, uh, but nobody really wants to think about how they store that data, how they preserve it over time, how they archive it, how they describe it. That's, you know, I don't want to do anything, and I want that data to go somewhere. Um, I want my data kept on something cheaper and more robust than hard drives on a bookshelf in my office. So I want, I want to put it somewhere where someone else is taking care of it and I don't really have to pay all that much for it. So um, kind of competing needs. I want to share larger amounts of data with collaborators, including ones far away. Sounds like a dumb problem. Um, like if you want to share a file with uh, Dropbox or you want to email someone some, uh, a Word document, obviously that's possible. It becomes significantly harder when often they're dealing with uh, institutional IT systems that only know your identity domain. So for instance, in Monash land, a lot of these systems, you have to be a Monash person to log in to actually get a, to get a look in at any data. Um, of course, research transcends universities all the time. It transcends uh, national borders. If you want to share with your collaborator in Canada or you know France, uh, then how are you going to get this wealth of data out there? Again, it's kind of a stupid problem, but it's a significant problem for researchers that we hear over and over again. Um, and so. 
out of those four points, it turns out that the first one is actually the most hard to solve because of the diversity of instruments and the number of them and how it's increasing. And so for this first very significant point, um, James Wentnell is going to come uh, and, and talk about how he's developing an app to, that you can essentially drop on instrument computers no matter what they are uh, within certain reason. Um, not 386s with Windows, you know, 3.1, but you know, above that, we, we set the bar low. And the point is you have an instrument where you don't really care at that point what it is. You should be able to install this app on it and it should be able to talk to a big TARDIS that lives somewhere and you don't have to care uh, how that big TARDIS is managed. It's in the cloud. You don't have to think about it. It's, it's just like Facebook. It's there. Or Google. It's there. You don't have to think about exactly where it is. And so that part, the big TARDIS where the data goes there, that's actually what Chris is going to talk about. So um, come here, James, and, and dazzle people with my data. Thanks very much, Steve. Australian synchrotron deployment. And I've started looking after, a, uh, in many ways, much smaller deployment of my TARDIS at an optical microscope facility at Monash. So it's, it's certainly smaller in terms of the amount of data we've ingested, but it actually has quite a large number of instruments. I think we've got up to 20 microscopes or more in this facility. Sorry, up to at least 20 microscopes in this facility spread out over multiple campuses. And there are two problems we face. One is our current method of deploying an instrument onto the MyTARDIS workflow requires some significant IT expertise to add the new microscope. Whereas we'd like the users or the managers of the microscope facility to be able to add a new microscope themselves just with a double click install. The other problem we have is diagnosing problems. If one of our 20 microscopes hasn't fed any data into my TARDIS for the past week, we don't know whether that's because no one's used that microscope or because the microscope PC has dropped off the network or because someone has sabotaged the software that we install on the PC. We don't know. So we've, we've looked at developing a, a desktop app. Um, the idea being that users can install this on the microscope PCs and then they can actually find it easier to monitor the upload so they can help to diagnose problems and they get some more immediate feedback and adding a new microscope will be as easy as a double click install we hope. So let me bring up this app that I'm talking about. Um, it's currently known as uh, My Data which is um, a term that I think appears in the MyTARDIS web interface already. Um, so the particular facility I'm working with, they switch off their microscope PCs every night and on in the morning. And so the idea is that this app just silently starts up every morning when the PC is switched on and kind of runs in the background and checks whether anything needs to be uploaded since um, yesterday. So if I open up the main interface, the very first time the user runs this app, they'll have to enter a few settings about the microscope. Um, currently only one upload method is fully implemented, which is HTTP POST. So all we need for credentials is basically an API key to the MyTARDIS web interface. But down the track we'll implement some other upload methods such as um, secure copy and NFS mounts, all sorts of things. Um, so the first time you run the app you'll have to enter these settings and then they just get stored locally. So if I now, so one of those settings was the central data folder where all the users save their data. Each user has their own folder. So I'm now going to drag a folder into my username's data folder, which is being watched by the app. So I've got a folder called Microscope Images. I'm going to drag it into my folder. And then I'm going to go back into this um, My Data app and press refresh and just give it a, a minute to scan the directories. And then hopefully we'll actually see this new folder being added as a data set and being uploaded to My TARDIS. So, so yeah, the, the new folder I just added, Microscope Images, is there. And we know that it's got 12 files in that folder. So there's six of 12 files uploaded. If I go to the Uploads tab, um, if I'm quick enough, oh, I don't think I was quick enough to show you the progress bars in action, but that um, it should actually be uploaded now. So if I go into the MyTARDIS web interface, um, yeah, 
there's, so there's the new data set that I just added. So I just copied a, a data set folder and pressed refresh on the app, which, which it would automatically do every time it starts up each morning. And it's now in TARDIS. This, this, TARDIS, this is a test TARDIS VM running on the Nectar Cloud, yes. And, and this, this app was developed leveraging other technologies uh, built in Nectar projects, including the RESTful API uh, built for TARDIS for the Synchrotron, and also leveraging off some technologies from the CVL, the Characterization Virtual Laboratory Project. Um, anyway, so thank you for listening to the demo. Uh, if there are any questions, come and find me later on. Um, I'll hand over to Grisha. It looks like this, and uh, it runs in Nectar. Uh, it's distributed over several nodes in different availability zones, all working together. It's hard to see, but you have to take my word for it. Um, and uh, now I, I want to show you one, I think, most useful new feature that was developed recently, which is you can't only access the you can't access the data only via um, via the web. You can now which you know, you can download all, all the known things. You can also use SFTP. So in this case, I use FileZilla, which is an open source free um, SFTP client. And um, I log in as myself. So user, I typed in the password earlier. And then I have here a view of the data on my TARDIS. Here, defining the interactions. For example, this is some public data. I find here that same data set. And how big is it? It's 3.9 gigabytes, so I can just um, annoy everyone who wants to use the internet and download it while we stand here. <laughs> and um, it downloads uh, 10 files in parallel, so you will see the files transferring down here, and it, it makes it much easier to access the data if you don't have to go through a web page and click all the files, and then the web browser crashes, and so you can really have direct access to your data. And um, and um, so, and, and one good use case for this is you can access the data from other computing systems, and one of them is the virtual uh, virtual lab, the virtual desktop that. Chris Hines over there will present after our presentation, and he will have access to this data from his virtual computer. And if you stick around, you will notice this integration is really very powerful. And I'll hand over to Steve to wrap it up. So all I wanted to say is this is part of, obviously, a greater, bigger plan and goal that we have. Um, what you see here with store.synchrotron where there's uh, this central service for the synchrotron running across multiple nodes around Australia for, for redundancy and, and actually performance, you know, where, depending on where you're downloading from. This is actually a model that we want to repeat for other facilities but under the same service. So you should be able to go to store.ansto.org.au. You should be able to go to store.monash.edu because we're too hipster to put AU on the end. Um, you should be able to go to store.whatever and, and, and see your data from that facility and you're actually connecting to the same set of Nectar servers. So it's the same service, but the URLs uh, change depending on what you want to log into. And that operationally, uh, that makes it very attractive to, as a service to run. Um, it makes it easy for people to get in because they're getting into the same system and you can share with all the same people. And it kind of becomes this collective place for all your data, a kind of single service. Um, the data itself can be stored elsewhere. It can be stored all over Australia. Um, the service itself is running uh, at this point all over Australia, um, but the idea is uh, you get the data in your particular facility uh, through the same service that's operated by a single set of people with support people around that and uh, you don't even know the difference. That's the grand plan. It's called store.star now uh, because in an email I said store.wildcard, meaning whatever and now it's sort of escaped and people are calling it store.star. So kind of expect that to come out of this store.synchrotron work very soon. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Chris, who's going to show you how to work with this data in the, the Nectar Virtual Lab, the characterization virtual lab. <laughs>